Spot On is sponsored by the Wellbeing Project here at Boston University. This project is a new campus-wide initiative to support students' health and wellness during their time at the university. Log on to bu.edu to learn more about the Wellbeing Project. You are listening to Spot On, a health and wellness podcast that breaks through the latest media headlines to provide you with accurate and usable information that is, well, spot on, spot on to meet your needs. I am your host, Dr. Joan Salji Blake, a nutrition professor at Boston University and the author of the college textbook called Nutrition and You, which is used in colleges across the United States and abroad. I'm so excited about this episode because we did something that was really brand new for Spot On. We did a live segment, a live episode with a live audience. And then let me tell you, it was thrilling and exciting all at the same time. And to do that, I had to bring in a rock star. I had to bring in somebody that truly was going to bring the crowds in, and I did. I had as my guest when we did the live segment, a Dr. Sandro Galia. He's a physician epidemiologist and author, as well as the dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. He has authored over 11 books, one of which is called Well, his latest one, and over 750 scientific articles. He was named one of Time Magazine's uh, most brilliant innovators and named one of the world's most influential minds by Reuter. I mean, that's pretty good darn stuff. Another exciting thing that we are doing that we never did before, Dr. Galea has been gracious enough to autograph three copies of his new book, Well, and we're going to raffle that off on the Facebook page. So go to our Spot on Facebook page to learn how you can be one of these winners. With that, let's go to the live episode with Dr. Sandro Galea. I'm going to embarrass him because I'm going to tell you a funny story. He wrote this book called Well. I go and I call over to the School of Public Health and I say, I really want him to come on spot on. And the person, he says to me, what year? I said, what do you mean what year? Like this year. And he says, uh uh-uh, that's not going to work. What about next year? How about early next year? Oh, no, that's not going to work. And I am so excited that you were here. So thank you again for coming on. Thank you. I want to know the backstory. I love stories. What is the backstory? How did you start out as a physician? Yes. Well, you still are. Yes. You still are, thank goodness. And why did you come on over to falling in love and really doing public health? Look, I always wanted to do the kind of medicine that could help anybody. And I did that. And I actually did residency in northern Canada. And I practiced in northern Canada. And then I practiced in places like Papua New Guinea and Somalia. When you do that kind of medicine, you realize that in order to help people, you really need to understand the world around them. Hmm. And, uh, and in some respects, it's an instinctive understanding. But I think I came to it most while I was working in Somalia. While I was working in Somalia, I, I was the only doctor for about 350,000 people in, um, in the Mudug uh, region. That, that and, was uh, the do- Doctors Without Borders? There's Doctors Without Borders, you yeah. you want to yeah. explain what that is? Uh, doctors Without Borders is a humanitarian organization where doctors are sent in places where there are no doctors. I was the only doctor in this region. This is for anybody who's watched movie Captain Phillips. It's sort of where the where the movie was filmed. It's that, that area. It was a few years after the Black Hawk Down episode. Mm. So I was the only doctor in this region. So I was doing a lot of good. I was uh, There were people who were coming to hospital all the time and I was helping people and uh, it was exactly what I was trained to do. I was trained to help people in remote areas and I was being very useful. And I remember feeling like, okay, this is good. I'm doing this. This is good. But once I leave, Nothing's going to change. And I knew I knew I was going to leave. I was there for a fixed term. I, I, I felt like the proverbial man at the side of the river. You know, when you see somebody floating down the river and uh, you jump in to save them and you feel good. And then somebody else comes down and you jump in to save her and you feel good. And somebody else and you jump in to save them and you feel good. But you're never stopping to ask, why are they falling in the river to begin with? So I decided I needed to learn what is it that makes people fall in the river. And I didn't know anything about public health. I didn't know anything about what really really shapes health. I was trained as a doctor at a very good medical school and very much how to be a doctor and to heal people who were already sick. But I did not understand anything about what really 
causes health. So I decided to, to go back to school and do a master's of public health, really just because I had sort of heard of master public health. A, a, a colleague had done an MPH, then I went on and did a doctorate, and then I've been in my public health my whole life. But really it emerged from being in clinical medicine, being a doctor, and realizing the futility of clinical medicine when really what I cared about was about health, about creating health. And health is not the same as healthcare. And that was my realization then. And that has been the animating realization then for the past 20 years of my career. So in other words, you went from from helping one to one uh -huh. to now helping one to a million or so. That's the, that's the idea. That's very interesting when you said that health is not health care. What, yes. what do you mean by that? Yeah, so it's a big difference. And uh, we make that mistake all the time. We tend to think of health and health care as being the same thing, but they're not. And, you know, sometimes I, I challenge um, people who I'm talking to to say, have a conversation with your friends and start talking about health and take out a watch and see how long it takes for one of your friends to use the word health care instead of health. And it's always under five minutes. Somebody always says health care when they mean health. Health is a state of not being sick to begin with. Mm -hmm. Health care is what helps you become healthy if you're already sick. But what we really care about is health, not healthcare. Healthcare is a means to an end. What we care about is a system that invents and invests in the preventive conditions of health. What we really should care about is about these preventive conditions. We should really care about safe houses and good schools and livable wages and gender equity and clean air and drinkable water and a fair economy. That's what we should care about. And those are the forces that generate health. Healthcare is a totally different matter. Healthcare is about if I'm already sick, how do I restore, how do you restore me back to health. Now don't get me wrong, healthcare is important. Healthcare remains important because we will all be sick at some point in our lives and we do want a good doctor and a good nurse. But ultimately, wouldn't you rather never see your doctor and nurse at the end of the day? You wanna be healthy and that's what I care about. Right, so that, that is fabulous. So what we're gonna say is that we want to not get them into the hospital. We don't want them to have sickness. We don't want them to be malnourished. We don't want them to be obese. We'd like to get it before them with good health. Absolutely, one, uh, one uh, metaphor which I use sometimes is um, about your car. I mean, do, do, do you wanna spend time with your car in the shop? No, what you want is your car, whatever car you like, to drive and get you places. That's what you want. Nobody likes to take the car in the shop. And what's interesting about it, if you think about it, using the car metaphor, we spend all our time talking about healthcare, which means it's almost like we spend all our time talking about the, taking the car into the shop rather than about the car, about how well it drives, what color it is, what the interiors are like. And it's the same with health. We should be spending our time talking about health not about healthcare, which is when we take our own bodies in the shop. Right, so interesting. You have in your book the, the metaphor of the goldfish. Yes. Could you, I, I, love, uh, yes. I love this, please tell me. It's the my favorite metaphor. Yes. So the goldfish metaphor is like this. It's, um, you know, you have a goldfish and you love your goldfish and you want them to be healthy. So you tell your goldfish to swim around the bowl clockwise 10 times every day and counterclockwise 10 times every day so they can get the exercise. And when you feed them goldfish food, you tell them not to eat too much food so they don't get fat. And when they get sick, you get them to see a good goldfish doctor. And one day, despite all this, your goldfish still die. And you say, why are my goldfish dead? I got them a good goldfish doctor, they exercised, they ate well. And you're like, ah, I know why they died. They died because I forgot to change their water. And if you forget to change the goldfish water, doesn't matter if you eat well, doesn't matter if you exercise well, doesn't matter if you see a good doctor, you're still going to get sick. And, and that's exactly what the book's about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That ultimately, ultimately, we are not have a, well, a world, we're not going to have a world that generates health unless we pay attention to the conditions and the forces around us that create health. The environment, what's going on? You said the forces. Correct. I'm getting a little emotional because my first goldfish died because I never changed the water. Sorry so. about that. Yes, yeah. me too. You said something in the book which I thought was fabulous. You said your zip code is more important than your genetic code. Yes. Can you explain that? Yeah, and it, it, this is, a, this is a, a formulation that has been... Um, that has gained traction in scientific worlds that, uh, that I'm in. Your zip code is where you live. 
And everything about where you live determines your health. Where you live determines the air you breathe, the water you drink, the parks you play in, whether your house is safe or not, whether or not there are sidewalks that encourage you to exercise, whether or not you're gonna get shot if you go walk in the street, where you work and the quality of your work and the conditions with which you can take maternity leave or not, or whether or not you are abused in the street. All of these things are determined by where you live, which is your zip code. So your zip code matters much more than your genetic code. It is a misconception that genetics matter that much for health. In fact, they don't. In fact, genes account for five, ten percent of your health at most. Where you live is 20, 30 percent. Your behavior is another 20, 30 percent. So where you live and how you live matter for a majority of your health. And I often feel like if we were to understand this, we would change and shift our emphasis for the better. Right. And that's so true because if you're living in a zip code that's not one that is healthy zip code, you want to say, and you don't have like a supermarket in yes. walking distance, you know, you have pollution and it's going to affect your ability to make good nutrition choices, good healthy choices. Yes, it does. It, it, and uh, well, let's, let's, let's take nutrition, for example. Okay. It's a good example because we, we often say, well, if somebody is uh, unhealthy or obese, well, it's their fault because they're eating bad food. Well, is it really, though? Because ultimately, we eat the food that's available to us, even those of us who have discipline. And the food that's available to us can be healthy or unhealthy. So let me, let me use a couple of examples. A bagel today has about 280 calories. 20 years ago, bagels had about 140 calories. Now, you and I, we're the same people. We were both around 20 years ago. We have a bagel today, we had a bagel 20 years ago, and all of a sudden we've had twice as many calories. So, so that has nothing to do with our choice. I mean, I suppose we're choosing to have a bagel, but it's the same choice, which now has a lot more calorific consequence than it did 20 years ago. At another level, Okay, will I eat healthy or not? It depends. If there's no supermarket around that's selling broccoli, I'm likely not going to eat broccoli just because it's not, it's not around. So, so even things that are perceived to be ultimately individual choices, which is the food I choose to touch and put in my mouth, ultimately is driven by the context around me. It's ultimately driven by the world around me and the options that the world affords me. Why is this message not getting out? Well, I mean, you're getting it, obviously. You're, no, no, you're it's, the, it's, you're a, the it's, it's a great, it's a great, it's you're, a great question because, in in uh, in many ways, everything I'm saying is obvious. And yeah. and and, and, when, and um, when I when I do formal talks or people read the book, I get one of two reactions. One reaction is everything you're saying is obvious, or the other reaction is, whoa, this is so radical that nobody's talking about it. And uh, perhaps. Both are true, and in, in many respects, it is obvious. There is nothing that novel about what I'm saying, but we're not talking about it. And you know, we're in the middle right now as we're doing this uh, interview of election season, mm. and there's a lot of talk about health in election season, but it's there, not really. It's mm. not talk of health, it's talk of health care. Right. None of, the, none of the candidates on the Democratic side, certainly on the Republican side, are there saying that to have good health we must treat health as a public good. That means that we must think of health the way we do parks, education, the post office, fire stations, the environment. We must treat health like a critical piece of our shared collective good with investments for all. Nobody's saying that, and that is how we must treat health. An important aspect is that my health depends on your health whether I like it or not. Because it's easy to look on when, when a group, often a small group, is, has poor health and to think, well, it's regrettable, it's a problem, and we can toss them some charity, but it's ultimately their problem, not my problem. But that is not the case. That's wrong. That is simply wrong. And, and we see that all the time. And right now we're in the middle of this coronavirus epidemic. And what else do we need to remind us that it's an interconnected world? Our health is deeply interconnected and your health and my health are interconnected. And once you understand that, you realize that it is important to make an investment in our shared health.
Are you having trouble sleeping, focusing, or relaxing? If the answer is yes, then the TM Soft's White Noise Sleep Sounds podcast has got you covered. This hour-long podcast is made to help you get rid of distractions, reduce stress, relax, and most importantly, get better sleep. You can listen to sounds of nature, white noise, relaxing music, and much, much more. You can check out the TM Soft's White Noise Sleep Sounds podcast on Spotify or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. When you when you look at the environment, I mean, you can look at your neighborhood, you can look at making sure that's healthy, but even your workplace environment. Yes. Uh, even your school yes. environment. I Absolutely. Mean, these are all environments that matter for your health, and these are overlapping environments. There's your home environment, or your workplace environment, your school environment. These are environments that affect everything about us, and, and they affect everything about us in terms of they influence what we do, the choices we make, they influence our social networks, they influence us in terms of the physical spaces in which we are in, the air around us, the food that's available to us, the extent to which we actually are exercising or not, the people who we interact with, whether or not we are exposed to violence or not, these are all influenced by our environments. You know, um, I had uh, did an article for The Globe on wellness at the workplace. Mm -hmm. And a great statistic was that for every three dollars that a corporation invests in, you know, work this wellness, yes. it, it affects the bottom line and it makes a profit for them. Yes. So when we talk about this health, health for all, everything, sometimes you have to talk money. You have to say like it would save so much mm -hmm. money, like in what you're just saying. You know, if you could, if we could not not use health care to keep people yes unsick, prevent. And and we know this. For example, early childhood education programs return five dollars for every dollar spent because children grow up healthier, you have less teen pregnancy, you have uh, greater literacy, more likely to go to college. We know that. We're seeing this in the private sector as well as in the public sector. I'm talking all the time to colleagues in the private sector who are beginning to realize that their bottom line is affected by investments in the world around us. That's that's fabulous. That's absolutely fabulous. It is, it is, it is a good, it is a it good is move. Good. And it's, it is dramatically different than it used to be five years ago and 10 years ago. Right. You, you talk about obesity, and obesity is right in my world here. And you know, we have over 70% of Americans overweight, and about half of them are obese. Let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. I think the mistake that we have made in thinking about obesity, which I've written as sort of one of the three most important epidemics of our time, is in treating it as a individual behavioral choice. I just think that's simply false. I think we are all imperfect. We all make the wrong choices about everything, including food, all the time. And, and ultimately, the, the approach to obesity as a, an epidemic has to be structuring the world around us to nudge us and channel us into healthier dining options. It's actually that simple because I, left to my own devices, I'm always gonna have the chips. I'm going to always choose the things that ultimately are not particularly good for me. And I don't think I'm that special, I don't think I'm that different. So the mistake we've made with obesity is that on the one hand, we do a lot of finger wagging at people and saying you should eat more healthy. On the other hand, we subsidize corn that leads to the mass production of calorie-dense, nutrient-poor food. The mistake is if we're saying that it's about the individual and we're expecting her to make choices. Let me give you an analogy. I think my favorite analogy for this is one of the biggest successes of health in the past century, which is the decrease in risk of dying in a car accident. So for every vehicle mile you drive, for every mile you drive today, you have more 200-fold less chance of dying than you did 100 years ago. 200, that's an extraordinary difference. And why is that? Is it because drivers are better? No, drivers are still terrible. Drivers were terrible 100 years ago, they're still terrible today. They're distracted and uh, they do things they shouldn't be doing in their car. And uh, they, uh, they're calling their friends, you know, they go too fast. We know that. No, the reason that it's so much safer in your car is because of seat belts and because of airbags and because of shatterproof glass and because we have laws that do not allow people to drive while they're under the influence. What we have done 
is we have accepted that people are going to be imperfect drivers and built a safer car and road around them. And that is exactly what we should be doing around obesity. Accept the fact that I am always going to choose the Cheetos because they're kind of good. And, but to build the world around me, we're actually, I don't have that much access to Cheetos and I only do every once in a while, where in fact, I'm surrounded by healthy food options. And that, to my mind, is the only solution to the obesity epidemic. Now I gotta get the food companies mm -hmm. on board. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. you've gotta make, we know that the number one reason why people eat is taste, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we have to make the healthier foods mm -hmm. affordable and taste good. Correct. Um, and, and convenient. Yes. And we're seeing better. We are seeing some, so some arresting of the obesity trends and some reversal of these trends in particular age groups is because we are better on this. Is because we are, we have made tasty food more readily available and more conveniently available for more of us. And uh, you know, the mistake we make all the time is like, we talk to highly motivated people and say, well, you know, I, I have the self-discipline, I'm never gonna pick up uh, the, uh, the unhealthy food and I'm gonna go on my way to buy the healthy food. Well, yes, there's a segment of population who's like that, but most of us are not like that. Most mm -hmm. of us will eat what is tasty Mm -hmm. and what is conveniently available. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so the challenge is to make sure that what is tasty, what we're likely to eat, and what's conveniently available is going to be health promoting. Right. You know, uh, the latest dietary guidelines mm -hmm. came out with, it's probably based on your research, that stop blaming yes. the individual. I mean, it, it's, it takes a village. Hashtag it takes a village. That you have to, you know, you gotta help them, but you gotta have better food and, at the and, workplace. And, and, yeah. and that is true for everything. We're talking about obesity, but it's true for everything that we need to stop blaming the individual. We need to stop thinking that people are going to behave better because we tell them to behave better. In fact, the science on this is pretty clear. People do not really behave better when you tell them to behave better. I mean, that's true in ob that, that is true in obesity. It is true in driving, just telling people to drive better. It is true in uh, people having intimate relationships. People do not change behavior. The latest fallacy on this has been around genetic testing. There's been a uh, growing fascination with genetic testing, and part of the, the logic behind that has been, once you tell people their genetic risk, people will change their behavior. In fact, the science has emerged on this, and it's not true. People get no genetic risk, and they keep doing exactly what they were doing before. So, so, so we, we as humans are left to our own devices, are pretty terrible at our choice making, which means that, that our options need to be structured in such a way that they promote our health. Now, one of the challenges to this that often one gets is to say, well, you are restricting people's freedoms. But that line of thinking is deeply flawed because there are different kinds of freedoms and there's a freedom, there's a freedom to and a freedom from. And changing your freedom to eat only Cheetos is a freedom that's equivalent to your freedom from not being unnecessarily obese or not dying in your car. So what I'm saying is we should be privileging our freedom from unnecessarily being burdened by morbidity and mortality, by disease and by dying young. And that is what building a healthy context does. So what we're saying here, if I got this right, you want to set up the environment that the healthier choice, whatever it is, is the default. It's Always. It's easy. Poll after poll after poll show very clearly that health is always the single most important abiding concern for Americans. It's always health, it's always health. And, and I've talked to, them, done talk radio and uh, done talks in uh, right-wing parts of the country and people disagree on all sorts of stuff. But you know what nobody ever disagrees on? Nobody ever disagrees that they want their children to be as healthy as possible. Right. This is actually a unifying and animating value. And, uh, and, and as a result, I think it gives us, it, it gives us the motivation to structure a world that generates health. And we should fulfill the responsibility to do that. And you said something in the book, Ted, you have to value health. 
Yes, and we have to value health, and we have to not just value health, we have to demand health. We have to demand health from the private sector and from the public sector. And to say that we want a world that generates health. Now, what does that mean? In the public sector, it means we vote for candidates who actually are going to promote our health. In the, in the private sector, it means we should patronize industries and particular companies that are health promoting and not others that are not. We, we have a lot of power as citizens and as consumers. I always say that you talk with your food dollar. So if yes. you're going to go into the supermarket, everybody's buying you know, cookies, they're going to produce more cookies. Yes. But if everyone's going in there and say, I want healthier food, they'll give you more broccoli. Yes. They'll, they'll sell you anything. They don't care. So that's so interesting because that's so empowering to now, the and consumer. And let, me, let me even add to that. It's not even th that uh, you said they don't care. I, you know, knowing a lot of people in the private sector in, in these worlds, I actually think they would rather sell healthy food. Like, like actually, the, 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 our, our colleagues and friends who work in food companies, given, given the choice, given the capacity to, to make a profit anyway, they would rather make a profit and by making healthy food than unhealthy food. Like, like there are actually very few people out there who are mendacious who say, well, what I really want to do is make unhealthy food make people unhealthy. No, people who are working in the food industry, they would rather choose to make healthy food if they can. Our incentive and the incentive of food companies are aligned. We just need to make sure we bring them in line to allow food companies to, to do their business in a way that generates healthy food right. and creates a healthy world. So we have to get, get grassroots. Three things, you know, three takeaway messages that could help people to understand this and understand you know, how the environment really impacts their health. So I would say, number one, we need to demand health. And, and demanding health requires that we say we value health and we want to live in a world where our value is elevated and we need to demand health of the private sector around us and the public sector around, around us and that means so number one is we can create a healthier world we have the choice that's point a i think point b is we are not going to be healthy unless we are all healthy mm -hmm. like our health is interdependent and a healthy person and a healthy world are in a sense the same thing and we simply cannot avoid it and the third point is that health is generated throughout our life my health today is a function of my health as a younger person my health as a child and even my mother's health so our life circumstance the conditions of our life shape our health and that, and that means that we have no choice if we want to be healthy, but to make sure that we are living in contexts that generate health. And, 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 and these are all themes that emerge in the book. And uh, to my mind, once you understand them, you have no choice but to say, I want to invest in creating a healthy world because a healthy world and a healthy person are inextricable. And so, again, as a consumer, as a reader of the book, as a consumer, you are very powerful because you'll talk with your vote. Yes, and you talk with your dollar. Your dollar. And yes. you put the two together, especially in this year coming yes. up here. Especially we, this year. Especially this year. We need to talk. Yes. We need to talk loudly. And I love it. I mean, this is, I am going to remember this now forever that it, stop talking about health care and start talking about health. I mean, that is just, I, it's like the light went off. Yeah, let me, let me, let me tell you, let me give you another uh, metaphor, um, um, which um, actually features in, in the newest book that I have coming out with a colleague. It's the metaphor of the soccer team. Soccer is the sport that I care about. And um, you know, the way soccer team is played, you have 11 people on one side, 11 people on the other side, and uh, the, the, the point is you get the ball into the net on the other side, that's all. And the way soccer is played, I'm explaining the game because in case any of your listeners don't know the game. You have 10 players and they can only use their feet. That's why we call it football. But there's one player and she's the goalie and she, her job is to stop the ball from going to the net. And she can do anything she wants to stop the ball from going to the net. She can use her arms, her legs, her face, anything she wants. Now, remember, as long as the ball doesn't go into your net, you're going to win, right? So you say, okay, well, look, if I have the world's possible goalie, best goalie, I'm going to win. But when you look at a professional soccer match and you see the goalie, what she's doing is she's walking around, prowling, looking anxious, and she's yelling at the other players. And you know what she's yelling at them? 
she's saying, keep the ball away from me. Because if you ever played soccer, you know the net's pretty big. Doesn't matter how good your goalie is, she knows if the ball comes at her fast enough, the ball's gonna go in. Now, why am I telling the story? The goalie is healthcare. The goalie is your doctor. So you want a good doctor, you know, I want to be clear. You want a good doctor, because every once in a while the ball's gonna come close to the net and you sort of need a good doctor to save it. But what you really want is the ball not to come close to the net. What you really want is safe houses and good schools and livable wages and gender equity and clean air and drinkable water and a fair economy. And good food. That's, and good food, that's what you want. Right. That's what you want. And those are the other 10 players on the pitch. So, and, and when I tell that story, it's clear to anybody, you're not gonna win the game by a goalie alone. Right. Like, it doesn't matter how good your goalie is. You have the best goalie in the world. If the other 10 players are duds, you're not gonna win the game. And the winning the game means being healthy. Right. Winning the game means healthy. And, and this is why we need to see healthcare, medicine as part of a broader team. And in fact, a minority part, one player out of 11. Right. But that's not our conversation. Our conversation tends to be only about medicine, and it's simply wrong. Okay, so with that note, I want to thank you for coming on thank Spot you for having On. Me. This was just fabulous, and I hope that we will all now be thinking about this. It's those 10 players we got to be thinking about. Correct. More importantly Correct. than that goal lead. Spot On is sponsored by the Wellbeing Project here at Boston University. This project is a new campus-wide initiative to support students' health and wellness during their time at the university. Log on to bu.edu to learn more about the Wellbeing Project. Spot On is supported by the Boston University Sargent College's Master of Science degree in Nutrition program. Log on to bu.edu to learn more about this fabulous nutrition graduate program. Thank you for listening to Spot On. Please subscribe to Spot On on your favorite podcast app for new episodes every week. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Joan Salgy Blake. And also like our Spot On Facebook page and suggest topics for future episodes. And oh, by the way, could you ask five of your friends or family members to download Spot On and subscribe to it? Do I ask a lot from you?